Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Presentation Hell podcast, podcasting live from Embark Studios in Tampa, Florida. I'm here today with Wayne Dudding, who has an incredible background in in the Army and chemical engineering, but he makes chocolate. He not only makes chocolate, he has a software company, a tourniquet company on top of that. So, Wayne, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and, and, and how you came about this place. Yeah, well... Uh... I've got a, as you mentioned, I'm I've got closer a, to the microphone there. Okay. Just, you know, well, as, here you, you go. Uh, as you mentioned, I have a uh, diverse background. And uh, uh, so after I, uh, I'm retired from the Army and uh, I had some uh, rental properties down here in, in Tampa. Uh, at one point, I, after September 11th, uh, I was in the reserves then and I volunteered for active duty and just happened to be stationed down here at McDill Air Force Base at Central Command Headquarters. So that was how I got spent a lot of time here in Tampa mm-hmm. and really learned to like it and thought this is a place where I'd like to you know, eventually end up, at least have a second home here, okay. if not a primary residence. Um, and uh, so what led me to, to Embark uh, was a, actually a startup company, a partner of, of, that I met here in Tampa at Softworks over mm-hmm. in Ybor City. We pitched an idea and we were awarded $15,000 to get started with our idea. Right. The, the idea was for an automated tourniquet system. Uh, oh, the automated, tur- automated tourniquet. Yes. So, like, I, I, I look at your arm and it wraps it up? What, what are we talking about? Well, so it's you can think of, maybe a good way to think of it would be uh, like an AED. Uh, What's an AED? An AED is an automatic external defibrillator in case you have sudden cardiac arrest. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Demar Hamlin just used one, if you recall, from the Buffalo Bills. The, mm-hmm. the yeah, no, I remember that, yes. Him, right? That almost died on the field. That's what they used to resuscitate him. Uh, so those are, you know, widely available. There's one here in this building. Uh, so if for, for uh, extremity trauma, uh, you know, it would be nice if there was a device that was uh, something that a lay person could use mm-hmm. in case of, uh, you know, whatever the situation is, whether it's an auto accident or... Okay. Active shooter situation, or even we uh, always bring up the active shooter situation. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone so, always. So explain this to me. A tourniquet. I always think of things being wrapped around your arm or leg or applying pressure. How does it actually work? What it, What is the actual product that you're? You know, how how does it play? Yeah. So the well, the, the idea of a tourniquet obviously is is to uh, shut off blood flow in your extremities in case you know. If you, okay. Your, your so applying pressure, and, and that's why they right. wrap. And, and so the, the difficult part for a lay person is to know how to uh, put it put it on and uh, get the pressure right you mm-hmm. know, so they stop the bleed. It, it, it's you have to pull it really tight. And, and so so do you people, wrap it around the body and yank it tight so like like it's Velcro extreme. or something well, or so, you so, know? So this one has uh, a, a strap of you still have to put it on the person of course, but then you just push a button. And it sets the pressure and it, ma- it monitors and makes sure. Oh, oh, so it's almost like a uh, 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 blood pressure type Very of mechanism. Similar to blood pressure. Is it air filled? It's not. It's non pneumatic. Non pneumatic. So that means no air. No air. So what, <laughs> so what, what is it filled so with? It what motor. tightens it up? Is it, it like a, 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 weave, a motor? It has a motor and it has sensors. Motors it. and sensors? Right, right. So it, uh, you know, it tightens to uh, a so, set pressure. In some in some models, at other models we're we're looking at putting in. Is it controlled with a phone or anything? How is it controlled? It's well, you, so the there's a sensor that's built into the device. So when you push the button, it does the rest. So like, if your arm's cut open right now, right. I would wrap this thing around you and, and set the right. device, and it, it would and go, right. and you'd be like, dude, I'm not it's probably losing already I'm better. It's, it's already looped, so you would just slide your you know uh, slide it onto the person's mm-hmm. arm or leg. And just pull the strap. Does it only work on extremities? Yes. yes. Okay, so you, extremity trauma. if someone put it on their head, would they choke the shit out of them? Yes, they would. Okay, so it's not for that extremity. No. no okay, no. so, all right. So I'm, I'm just nice. trying to figure out where, it's, where it works. Nice. Yes. No, this is really cool. How did you get into this? Is this part of the, the medical training from the Army? Is there, like, we're in presentation hell mm-hmm. right here. Mm-hmm. What is the moment that you convinced someone or it convinced you you were talking about it that said, wow, I should be doing this. Yeah, what, uh, I guess it's maybe not a new idea. So that the idea of, of something similar to that has been around for a while. Uh, the thing, I guess, that motivated us at the beginning 
was we were uh, looking at exoskeleton systems. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one the military was developing at the time called the Talos system, uh, a tactical assault light operator suit uh, that had uh, all kinds of bells and whistles and, and body armor and, and had all these capabilities. It's Terminator type material exactly. he's talking about, exactly. by the way. Uh, so so this, this system, uh, if you were wearing it and you had an extremity injury, uh, it wouldn't be feasible to... Well, you couldn't apply it. On. Yeah, you couldn't take off your, on, your right? titanium so, legs or right, anything. Right. So all this stuff, right? So, so we were looking at a system that would be built in mm -hmm. you know, to the suit. And, and so that's what got us started. So it's almost like, like a space suit with built-in uh, uh, medical devices. So if you got wounded, it could give you your own tourniquet right, right. built and into it. All, down the road, we would... We're thinking of that type of a system that would God be a, an damn. autonomous system. So, a classic example would be, you know, from from our recent uh, uh, combat experiences with, uh, say, the, there's an IED. And okay, have you had combat experiences? Yes. Yes, you have. Yes, All, right. Have. Yes, All right. All right. We'll, like we'll ask about those afterwards, yeah. but go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, for for a, a, a incident involving an IED, uh, you might be blown from a vehicle and be unconscious. You know. This, this system that we're envisioning could, in fact, activate your tourniquets for you, knowing that you needed them based upon sense, all the Wouldn't, sensors that you would be wearing. But, but let's just say the bomb blew up and your leg got blown off. Wouldn't half of this system be blown away with it? Not necessarily. You know, so that's the thing. It's, uh, uh, you know, and again, looking at these future systems, right? So this wouldn't be a standalone device. This mm -hmm. would be integrated into an overall protective uh, system. Uh, now, these things are all still down the road. You know, they, 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 there's some concepts out there, but there's nothing that they've fielded yet. Uh, so are you, when you came into Embark over here, mm -hmm. you came in showing a technology, which is the tourniquet system built from this knowledge that you came from. And that's right. where you were welcomed here in, in probably one of the, the best, most fertile startup environment in all of North America here at Embark Collective. I, I'd agree. This is, a, this is quite a place. The two things happened um, th th that led me into here. So mm -hmm. I had a grant from the Air Force. Now, this is fast forward a few years from our starting point. That's always a good place to start, and, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Start at the beginning, right? So, uh, so this was maybe, you know, after the pandemic and everything. So, so we had about three years invested in the project, but by the time we came to Embark, uh, there's a group called Veterans Florida that offered mm -hmm. us a scholarship. Uh, and, and so the, uh, just about all of the first year that we were here was funded by them. So that was nice. And, and then uh, uh, we, we were uh, under contract with the Air Force at the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, in, in addition to all the, the other connections that uh, Embark has, they also had some connections with McDill Air Force Base. Yeah, well, McDill is very strong here in the Tampa area, and plus they have SOCOM in that area, which brings together probably, well, I won't say what it brings together. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, so SoftWorks it, mm -hmm. is an extension of SOCOM, yes. Yes, yes, it is. So anyway, yeah, so that, that's what led us into here, and and, uh, and now we're on our second year. We, we got another scholarship from Veterans Florida. Uh, so when do you think your product's going to be prime time? When I say prime time, obviously there's the – the first step of selling it to the military, the second step of selling it to the general general public or to hospitals or wh whoever your end consumer is of your product. Yeah, right now we have a, a viable prototype that demonstrates that capability of uh, being able to pull to a pressure. Uh, NIH has a standard pressure mm -hmm. of 300 millimeters mercury that, that uh, a tourniquet needs to be able to pull tight to. Uh, and so ours has demonstrated capability well beyond. It's like an internal airbag. Uh, kind of. Just for your you know, body. You ha you're wearing a ba airbag on your body. It applies pressure. It, it's a good way to look at it. It's like, so like Not an AA, literally, but... Or even a fire extinguisher or things like that, right? It's a piece of safety equipment mm -hmm. that, that, you know, should be ubiquitous. And, and you know, it, it should be like fire extinguishers. It should be everywhere. How long do you think it'll take before, you know, people see it in the real world? It actually gets used in combat or it gets used in... A, a law enforcement environment or something of that yeah, nature. So, there, so each of these use cases that you just referred to is a slightly different model. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we have to 
we're right now we're working to find a good partner to get traction in one or two of those areas so we've got the military version and we're still pursuing that we'd like to find a good private sector partner uh, the one we're looking at right now is the city of Tampa you know, mm-hmm. my talks with Lakshman and, and so we're trying to make that connection and uh, work with the city of Tampa to say like okay if you had these things where would you put them what would you need them to be able to do mm-hmm. how many would you need and, and, and try to start laying out that case so that uh, either uh, we're looking at NSF for mm-hmm. another grant or for potentially NIH or more DOD money or a private investor, you know, which is another thing that Mark's good at, right? So yeah. if we have a good business case and we pull it. So that's kind of where we're at. I, I want to point. I would say we're like, so if all those things came together, we're maybe a year to 18 months away from having something that could be marketed. Wow, that's impressive. And I, I want to point out something here that we, we both know and love is the doors that open being here in Tampa and Embark, the fact that your product gets to be considered on a municipal level in the development factor helps probably develop a better product in the long run. It probably helps in the potential success of your product. Right, right. And that's amazing. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, so anyway, it's, it's interesting, right? We're, uh, so what is it named? This is a portable tourniquet. What is it named again? One more time. Like, I just want to get it. The company's name is One Less Gold Star. One Less Gold Star. Okay, I get it. Oh, well, One Less Gold Star. Okay. So, uh, so each of these, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've called these things the Smart EQ uh, is the brand name that we're putting on. Smart EQ? Yes, so there'll be a Smart EQ. Sounds a, like a dating app. H. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the TQ is the, you know, like Smart Tourniquet. TQ. Smart TQ. Smart, uh, okay, I get so it. All TQ right. TQ is abbreviation for tourniquet. Right? That's so the Smart, smart TQ. TQ. Now you, that's a good name. Now I'm much better. The first time you came around, I was off in space. Now that I know what it is, I'm not going to miss it. This episode of Presentation Hell podcast has been brought to you by Presentation Hell, the book, Presentation Management, the book, all encompassed under Shuffler. Shuffler is enterprise storytelling. Earlier, a few minutes ago, we were just sp- speaking about the Smart TQ. See how good the name it is? It is really good. The Smart Tourniquet, basically getting response, medical response at the time of contact, almost instantly to save lives. We don't want any more gold stars, right? That's right. That's what we're looking for. But I would like to say something else. Wayne does something else in his spare time. He's not just a, someone out there saving lives that haven't been hurt yet. He makes chocolate. Yeah. Tell us. Yeah. Well, so uh, uh, you know, my background is chemical engineering, and, and so my military career, a lot of it was in the reserves. And so I had a civilian career besides, mm-hmm. and that civilian career was a chemical engineer. And uh, so I've always had an interest uh, in food science and, you know, being a foodie and uh, molecular gastronomy and those, you know, that type of thing. You are a chemical engineer. Out, right? Go ahead. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, and, and so it's always been interesting to me. And uh, maybe a bucket list item of mine has always been to attend the Penn State Ice Cream School. Oh, wow. Which is... Uh, it's been, they've been teaching it for 130 years. Mm-hmm. And anybody who's anybody in the ice cream business has been to the Penn State Ice Cream School. Is that like a whole semester class, or is it like a three-week class? No, it's this a, sounds, I'll it's go. a short course. It's uh, I eight, would do that. eight days. Eight I would days, do that. It's just all just making ice cream. It's actually uh, very hard to get into, so some people were on a wait list for four years. Ben and Jerry uh, couldn't get in. Ben and Jerry got in. <laughs> oh, I mean, all right. They, yeah, they were there, and Haagen-Dazs, <laughs> and uh, Jenny, you know, most recently, Jenny, mm-hmm. uh, she she went there uh, mm-hmm. to perfect her, her understanding of the physics. Is of that going to make your chocolate better? Well, yeah, so, so uh, oddly enough, while I was at ice cream school, they said, hey, by the way, we're running for the first time since 1994, we're going to be running our chocolate school. So I thought, well, I'll go to chocolate school to learn how to make good chocolate ice cream, right? The better I mm-hmm. understand chocolate, then I'll make good chocolate ice cream. But mm-hmm. as it turned out, when I went to chocolate school, I, I, I was more enthusiastic about making chocolate than I was ice cream mm-hmm. uh, for several reasons. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it, it's a better, it's an easier way to get started if you're going to get started in a food-related business. Mm-hmm. Chocolate, uh, you're working with a lot of uh, things that are already food safe, like in terms of spoilage and things like that. So that doesn't really spoil. So, chocolate, so one right? of the things with making chocolate, you have less of the preparation 
issues, yeah, so to speak. Have, you don't so like with ice cream, you have to keep the, the milk cold and you have to make sure it doesn't spoil and you have to keep the ice cream cold so it doesn't melt. And there's, there's these, all these logistics. What are the core elements of, ice, of, of chocolate? If I get a chocolate bar and had it right here, what okay. are the five things that I expect to find in it? Well, so it's pretty simple. Now, now what we're doing, uh, as opposed to like a lot of chocolatiers, they buy bulk chocolate from Belgium or wherever, right? Mm-hmm. And then they melt it down and they make various things. That's not it. really making chocolate. That's right. repurposing chocolate. And the big guys, like Hershey's or Nestle, they, they buy cocoa beans by the metric ton. They roast them very darkly and they alkalize the powder and they press right so they extract the cocoa butter from and, and so they use the powder is what they use to make chocolate bars with and there's nothing wrong with Hershey's chocolate I like it very much uh, but they have a different they have a different objective so uh, yeah it's they cash buy, they're well, looking no, for no, green no, you're no, looking I mean, for a brown well everybody's <laughs> trying to make money but but they so if if you get a Hershey bar today and you get one 10 years from now they want it to taste the same okay, okay? Yeah. and so there's off notes, off flavors, uh, characteristics mm-hmm. of the individual beans, where they come from. Uh, so when you roast it darker and you alkalize and you turn it into powder, so you, you tend to take away all of those. So uh, so the products. first ingredient we're talking about here is cocoa powder, right. and that well, comes from... Cocoa beans. Right? Well, so you take the beans, you roast them, you roast them. and then you, you bring it into a powder. From that powder is what you... Well, that's what they do. So that's, that's what they what do. do. All right. See, we do. don't we don't go to a powdered right. route. Right. So, you so know. what I'm doing, or, and what other bean to bar craft chocolate makers are doing is bean to bar. Did you hear that? Yeah. Bean to bar chocolatier. Right. Go ahead. So <laughs> chocolate maker, actually. Chocolate so maker. Chocolatier is a different. I, I'll, I'll explain that too. But uh, so, so I'm would characterize myself as a chocolate maker. Uh, so I get the beans, and I use a single origin. Uh, some people will blend maybe one or two, but the the whole idea is to retain the these these what. You know, do you take trips to Sac- South America to get I, your beans? I haven't yet. I, I know somebody who does that, though. And, and, uh, See, that's a business in expense. The United, in the United States. Yeah, that's a business expense. Well, at some point, I may go visit some of these places. But, but for, for right now, I'm still trying to select the beans that I really want to focus on. Okay. Um, and so it's better to go through a distributor. Who, Where do you get them from? Uh, well, there's, there's three or What's four. What's your favorite? How about this? What's your favorite? Let's just go from your favorite, My your favorite, favorite chocolate bar, your favorite bean okay, so to make to the chocolate bar. Let's okay. just kind of go through the process. Let's okay. start with the beans. All right. All right. So, so the beans, uh, <clears throat> one of the ones I've identified is from Sierra Leone. So that's where I've been making some of my first, uh, bars from. And so what's different with mine than, than, you know, the larger manufacturers and the other bean to bar people is you're trying to retain those characteristics of the individual. Look of the bean that you got. So the Sierra Leone beans are known as a cocoa forward bean, which means, you know, you initially taste like a fudgy flavor, which might sound kind of stupid as chocolate, of course, but uh, other uh, types of beans, you tend to have some fruity or some spicy notes up front. Uh, these ones don't so much. It's, it's more the, the cocoa flavor comes forward mm-hmm. early. And that's and then, why you like them. I, and yeah, well, that's one of the reasons. And then uh, they also have some fruit flavors, but they're more subdued, and they tend to be more back notes, uh, mm-hmm. they would be referred to as. So you could think of like a maybe like a blueberry flavor or a dried fruit or a plum. Okay, so you get uh, the beans in. Of, so, Are these so first you taste cocoa, fudgy, then you get kind of like a blueberry. So there's a fruity flavor to them, right? Mm-hmm. So, so these fruity flavors, you know, these other things are things that you don't get when you buy. It's like we're Hershey tasting bar. wine here. Or a lean, it's, a, it's a lot like tasting yeah. wine. It's, it's a, a lot true. like coffee. It, it's so like there's... Are you there's sure you're not a chocolatier the way you're talking about it? Well, no. <laughs> not, well, uh, so down those roads. Okay, so a chocolatier, uh, strictly speaking, they take chocolate from chocolate makers mm-hmm. and they turn them into... Nice fancy things like oh, chocolate. they're artsy fartsy things. people, exactly. not right. not real cooks. That's right. You're so a they, real cook. Well, no, well, I wouldn't say that, right? But they're but so that's a different it's a different type of skill set, right? So they're so, fashion over function, I'm not, right? So I'm not like an art I'm not like an artist, right? Yeah. And 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 they're into flavors too, right? They but they create different things with chocolate. So that's mm-hmm. so they're they're you know so that's what you would call a chocolatier. So okay, I'm I get a that. Chocolate maker. All right, I get it. So yeah. just to, just to clarify, the chocolate maker is a chef. The chocolatier is the artist. Well, I mean, 
Talk visual you're a artist. Chef too, right? All right, I didn't want to consider I, the chef I, not being an artist. I know that, I'm but I'm talking more visual, a, more well, I'm more big, presentation. I'm more of a manufacturer, right? Okay, I'll manufacturer, buy that. Maker, All right, you know, I'll buy that. They're more of the chef. So let's talk a little more about the manufacturing. You sure. get the you get the beans in. Okay. So what do you do with them? They come in a sack. They're in a burlap right. sack. Yeah, they're yeah, right they're in front right. of you. They land on the table. Yeah. What do we do? Okay. So then, so now this is where it's it's a lot like coffee, right? So there's different roasting techniques. So the beans have an innate characteristic but then you, there's light roast there's dark roast so you roast roasts. the beans we right. take it is there a heat that they roast it at yeah yeah so there and there's different methods of roasting okay so, you know you can do oven roasts you can do uh like a rotisserie type you know uh mm -hmm. roast what do you prefer what, let's go well, through I, your favorite so let's my, go through one process that you well, do here's where where i'm different maybe but so so me as opposed to other bean mm -hmm. bar makers where where i'm a lot different is i take a blend of different roasting techniques. So I've got like three mm -hmm. big techniques that I do uh, to roast the beans. And then I have ways of controlling those techniques within a dark and a light. Okay. And so what I'm trying to do is get, I'm trying to capture as many of those flavor notes as I can. Uh, you know, do the flavors like come out better and worse the way you roast them, Absolutely. the time you do Absolutely. it, the yep. heat you yep. do it with? Those are all right. Those okay, so now I've got a pile of beans here that are fully roasted. Right. Now some person, some people might say, you know, I'm going to try a light roast, I'm going to try a medium roast, I'm going to try a dark I've roast. I've drank coffee before, I know think, where you're coming from. Right, I'm, I'm going to find which one I like the best, and then that's what we're going to run. Okay, right? now that we've got some roasted I'm beans. I'm not doing that. I'm what? taking a little bit of each, and I'm trying to figure out how can I blend these all together to get the best notes out of all of these different okay. you know, things. So a dark roast will give you one type of notes, the light will give you a different one. I'm trying to blend them and capture them all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's I, I make the analogy between uh, a Pittsburgh style steak is is what. So my Pittsburgh style chocolate is the same as a Pittsburgh style steak. Okay. So Pittsburgh style steak. Some people may know uh, or not. You can go to any good steak restaurant in the United States and order a Pittsburgh style steak. They know what you're talking about. It just means it's burnt on the outside and raw in the middle. And All right. Everything in between. Right. So that's so uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Is capture all of those different flavors. So what is the next step after roasting? Okay, so then there's a very tedious process uh, of cracking and winnowing the beans. So cocoa beans have a husk on them, mm -hmm. and so you have to remove that husk. And uh, The innards are actually beans. white, aren't they? Well, so after you roast it, they're, they're actually, depending upon where you get the beans from, they're, okay. they're, they're different colors. All right, like I'll, I'll buy that. Hue, reddish, brownish. Kind of white, you know, kind mm -hmm. of like an okay. white. So know. now they're fully, do you grind them at that right, point? Right. Do you grind so them now, and turn them into a powder? Right, no, not a powder. Uh, so after you crack them and winnow them, so now this is where you get nibs, right? So now you've got cocoa nibs, basically, right? And then people, most people know what cocoa nibs are, right? So that's, that's Those are like have. the little, that's what you get when you think you got right. a cocoa bean and someone gives it to it's, you. And well, you the bean broken up is a nib. Okay, right? all right, I buy that. Removed. That's yep. it. That nib is about 50% uh, what you would call cocoa mass, the brown stuff, and uh, about 50% butter. Mm -hmm. So when you press, you make cocoa, cocoa butter. butter. That's where cocoa butter comes from. So right? you press it, the and butter the, out. the butter will come out, and that right. leaves it so to, now, to be dried out. But I don't press, so I just take the nibs right into a grinder. and, and then Which I'll keeps the cocoa it. butter in it. Does that make a different texture of the final product? Well, so, so I mean... People who make it, it does okay. okay. So so I guess the maybe the big difference is of course the, the powder is micronized right. Mm -hmm. So it's very so you have a very smooth texture in a in a you know a commercially made candy bar mm -hmm. Hershey Nestle one of the other big names. Uh, so my sometimes it's it's not necessarily perceptible but it's a little more grainy. Uh, in fact, okay. Mexican chocolate they they leave it grainy. Right, so because they like it, that's part yeah. of their okay. Yeah, so so it's a very coarse chocolate. So so it doesn't necessarily have the same mouthfeel as like a you know as as a. Uh, and this is what you like to do. Food. You like that type of feel when well, you make yours. Yeah, so I mean, well, it's it's part of the characteristic of the of the bar, you know, uh, of the bean to bar. You know, okay, is that it's not since you're not going to the powder stage, it's got it, it's got some uh, maybe a little. Not, okay, not now how do you now that we've got the, the the powder, the crunchy, not quite right, powder, right. but it's a little rough, it, rougher. 
what's the next step? Are we mixing with milk? Are we mixing with sugar? Are we well, are we going a, through a process? Like, tell 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 yeah. us and everyone out there listening, how do we make the candy bar? Yeah. How does it go from this this powdered chocolate? This we know how we got to the cooked bean. How do we get the next step? Okay, so you so you have the nibs now, right? And you put them into the grinder. Uh, in the case of a dark chocolate, uh, you just add sugar, and that's it. So you let it go, and, and it goes uh, anywhere from three to four days it takes to, to process. There's a is it, but that's just powder going through it. How does it become the well, chocolate so the, texture that I know and love? Yeah, so this is where you know a picture would be worth a thousand words. But uh, so within this grinder, when you put the nibs in, right? So it's fifty percent mass and fifty percent mm-hmm. butter. There's enough friction created in that wheel that the butter will melt. All right. So, so as these nibs are being ground, so that's where the actual thing coming. Wow. You know, it just liquefies. So when you look in a grinder after three or four hours, you see liquefied chocolate. That's literally it. It's that's literally it. just that's sugar it. and, and, and the sugar actual. And that's it. And if you want to make milk chocolate, then of course you add the milk, the, mm-hmm. the milk powder, uh, or any other flavorings that you want to put in. So there's, you know. I've made guava milk chocolates before, wow. which are very good. So just That's make guava powder. Or, or there's, I mean, that, so the sky's the limit. I mean, so I'm going to take a step back right here. Right? So. so making a chocolate bar is literally just taking the, the, the cocoa nibs, which are the, the beans, mm-hmm. grinding them up, the, the cocoa, the, the actual butter from it makes the moisture that, that helps create the texture of the chocolate that we know and love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, and you, you could, add sugar and anything else that, if you want right. almonds or some other crap. Right. You can do that too. Yeah, now, now that would be outside of the. Yes, that, but that's outside, outside of it. And then, but that's another variable, right? So there's all these inclusions. Well, that's where it becomes an art and, and all sorts almonds, of things. And you can have. So you can that's add. Where you can just turn it into Rice Krispies right? and make Nestle's Crunch. You can right. So there's <laughs> right. So that's uh, and what's interesting God, with uh, with with uh, chocolate is it's an it's so it's butter, right? So it's basically it's oil. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you add, even I never if you add, thought of it that so way. let's say if you add salt, right, you can add salt and it'll stay like little pieces of salt. Crispy, you know? yeah, because yeah, so it's I mean, oil. It it's, not, it's not soaking into it. Right, it's not, it's right. Not or, like, or like crisp rice, right? So if you put that in, it does like the, the, the chocolate doesn't soak into it. It doesn't become squishy over time. It enrobes it. Oh, nice. So now the, the, the rice stays crisp, you know, inside of the, the, of the chocolate bar. So there's all kinds. And then, so you can enrobe all these different things, you know, in, in chocolate. And, You're right. Uh, just to make the bars, right? So now, and that's, now that's, that's before you even get to the chocolate pier type creation. Well, we're going right? to, we're going to get into that in a minute. So stuff into the bars. And that you just put in a bar and that's your, you just put it in, into a mold and wrap it up yeah, and so you're good to go. The, that's the final, well, so that's not the final step, but. So you take the chocolate. Final step is getting paid and getting it out of the door. Nah, no, well, no kidding. So there's, well, it's a very important step. So when you take it out of the grinder, uh, you have to go through a tempering process. Mm-hmm. And so tempering is basically your, there's six different types of fat crystals that are in cocoa butter at various temperatures and, and, and uh, conditions. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of tempering is to try to get as many of one type of crystal as you can. Uh, and so, so you can think of it as looking at a parking lot with cars, right? So if everybody's parked in their space and everybody's lined up, or, or like a, a, a column of soldiers, right? Everybody's mm-hmm. left, left, right, left, and dress right, dress, mm-hmm. and cover down, and uh, so that's what you want to do when you're, when you're tempering. That's basically what you're doing. Well, you're crystal. separating the different components, of, not the co- the different consistencies. Well, you're actually making just one type of crystal, you know, by the way you Bring handle it, it oh, right? I- by controlling the temperature and the speed and the shearing of it, and uh, there's a couple different ways you can do it. One is by just, you, you've probably seen people on a piece of marble, right, taking spatulas and just moving mm-hmm. the chocolate back and forth. They're cooling it and they're shearing it, and that's what's I causing I thought they were just ma- teasing me with it. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to they're... maintain it at a certain temperature, right? So, so you don't want it to go mm-hmm. above a temperature again, or you're going to ruin... What are those right? temperatures for, mel- for chocolate? It's in the... Between 95 and 105. It, it, close. Uh, it's you know in the neighborhood of say anywhere from 89 to you don't want to get too much above 95. Okay. And, and, and gonna see, this is pepper. one of the things that I always knew you about chocolate. Seed. You can also seed it. So if you have some tempered chocolate already, you oh, you can mix that and, and help your, do it. And and within a temperature range, and and they will grow. So these oh. crystals that you're looking for will grow from wow. seed. And so that's that's the method I prefer myself. Personally. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So and there's machines, of course, that 
we'll temper chocolate for you, you know, but the, they cost money. I just it's one of the stuff. it's one of the magics of chocolates that I've learned about um, is that people love chocolate. It gives them a euphoria and they bite it and love it. But the little thing that's going on in the background is chocolate melts at your body temperature. Mm -hmm. So when you put it in your mouth and you bite it, it actually engages in a chemical reaction, releasing the taste, the coffee, the not the coffee, the cocoa, and all the flavors that are in it, and it hits you in such a harder fashion, and that's why there's such a rush from it. And I used to always think that, and I, it, I don't know, what do you think of that? Well, so not everybody eats chocolate deliberately. Um, <laughs> right? so Who are you talking to? They it up and they swallow it. But, but, you know, so if you break it down or, like, say, if you want to be, a, you know, if you want to be a chocolate snob, right, just like a wine snob, you want to, like, do an official taste test of chocolate. Um, so it's, it's very much what you said. The, uh, so you take a piece and you, and first of all, it should snap, right? So if you break off a piece, it should, that means it's well tempered. That also means. You have to listen to the snap of your chocolate. That's, so ah, it's, it's a good vintage. Say, well, say like if you leave it outside or you left it in your car, right, and it melts and it, it's not bad, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's not going to be tempered anymore. So it's going to be soft and, 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 it's, and it's not going to have that snap to it. Where the snap comes in, it's not so much the snap. As Believe me, I look shine, for snap in everybody. But it's, uh, uh, so it's, it's part of the flavoring, right? So whenever you take a bite of tempered chocolate, you, you, you begin chewing it, and it'll break into little pieces as mm -hmm. opposed to being soft and just kind of squishy. So, so those little pieces is where you get this initial, Rush. from a bean to bar, you'll get those fruit flavors or spicy mm -hmm. flavors, or in the case of the They'll Sierra be released Lent, when, it, when it actually crackles as It'll opposed to melting. It'll be a forward flavor, right? So that's where you get these initial flavors. So it's like a three-stage process. So the first one is that chewing and the breaking of the little pieces. Now, if you take those little pieces and you press them against the roof of your mouth with your tongue, and it melts, right? It body mm -hmm. temps, right? So it'll melt, and it'll basically coat your tongue with the cocoa mm -hmm. butter, with the fat. And now you're getting like a second release of flavor, which is more of the cocoa, the chocolatey flavor that you, you know, that you think of when you eat chocolate. That's See, where chocolate the is much more is. like a drug than you ever thought. And then when you swallow it, it hits the back of your throat, and then you'll get like a third types of notes. Now these tend to be things that don't sound that appetizing, but they're in there. Uh, and this is much like wine tasting, mm -hmm. where you know you swallow the wine, and that's where you get the tannins, right? Or your like your tongue gets fuzzy, and mm -hmm. these things that don't necessarily you don't think of as good tasting, but there's like an earthy type flavors, or leathery type flavors, mm -hmm. or some people say like mushroom type flavors, or even like dirt, right? There's like, like these dirt flavors dirt. that are in the back. It's like of your the coffee I swallow. get at the corner in the morning. Yeah. So so <laughs> the you know so so there's these different flavor profiles that, that so like. You know, every time you eat chocolate, you're not necessarily thinking about all these things. But you're right; it's a, it's, it's in, it's your your brain is being affected mm -hmm. at different levels by, you know, by very chocolate, impressive. You know. And then of course it's sweet, right? So it's got the sugar in it, so you're getting the sweetness too, uh, at, at various degrees, right? Whether it's dark chocolate or milk chocolate or whatever, uh, you know. There's you know talking about uh, dark and milk and things so a lot of people eat chocolate because they think it's good for them and there is some evidence that it is it's it, for cardiovascular health uh, turns out you can eat milk chocolate dark chocolate it doesn't really matter it, it's still better. see i never had a problem with either i never questioned it yeah well some people eat like so some people you know i've talked to uh people who will eat dark chocolate for its health benefits and they'll prefer to get the darker they don't necessarily like it. They just think it's better for them. Mm -hmm. You know, in theory. I've heard that. I've heard that right, it is. I don't know. You know, it, well, milk chocolate's good for you too. You know, it's just, right, you well, that's good to hear. Like, you know? So the theme of what I'm hearing here is chocolate is good for you. Don't ever question it again. Chocolate <laughs> is good for you. And no, this well, is an expert. What right, we just so. what we just heard is like a a, a Kovac, someone coming from from uh, France talking about wine. The expertise, the bouquet, the way it breaks, the way it crumbles, the way it engulfs your mouth and coats the butter over your tongue. It gives a, a release to your brain. I heard all these words coming out of you. This is very real. I yeah, think it's pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah. I never thought of chocolate that intensely linked with how it affects you, but no wonder why it, it yeah. works. Well, no, of course, you know, I mean, if you're diabetic, of course, right, you have to control your sugar intake and things. So it's all things in moderation, but... But there, there are some 
proven health benefits to you know. Let exactly alone the smile, making up for making for doing a stupid act. Chocolate is a lot of times works yeah, very yeah, well that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've seen it be very valuable on many different levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it makes kids smile. It, yeah, you know, right. So, so uh, yeah. So, so there's there's those aspects to it too, right? And and even for uh, you know, there's a, there's actually a professor uh, from Penn State who who gives a very good lecture on the health benefits of chocolate. That's an hour long. He knows a lot more about it than I do. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of positive. Would you come back and we can do a t- tasting here, or, or maybe a making, Absolutely. and maybe we can describe the cocoa butter and where it is and just give more information yeah, at another absolutely. time? Absolutely, I'd love to come back. There's, uh, uh, I've told people, as, as long as you want to sit and listen, I can talk about chocolate. So can can anyone <laughs> buy your chocolates at this point, or is this have, just your own hobby and you like to treat people around no, you? No, I have, I, I have an LLC set up, and uh, we're looking to hit the market maybe around September, October. Do you have a name for it yet? It's called Steel City Gastronomy is the name of the company. I'll probably have individual bar names. Steel City Gastronomy. Right. And Why? Uh, well, because I, I, I plan to do things besides chocolate, so chocolate is where I'm getting started with, but uh, so I'm not Steel City Chocolate Company. Because okay, I all plan right, I'm just making But why Steel cream, City? Right? Why so Steel City? Cream, right, well, I'm from Pittsburgh, so... Uh, You're right. Uh, we're not selling ketchup here. Well, we're, we're uh, no, but uh, <laughs> we're looking for a sister company uh, that will... Uh, most likely incorporate the name Gaspar somehow. Mm-hmm. Okay, I know where we are. Up. There you go. And I'm looking at uh, some of these tropical flavors that I mentioned, like guava and, and passion fruit, and, and doing things with that. Well, uh, good luck with it. I'll be a taste chocolate, tester. Of course, that's another quick uh, subject. So some people say, like, ah, oh, white chocolate isn't really chocolate. Well, white chocolate is made from cocoa butter, right? So that's, mm-hmm. that's the. It's coming from that nib. Same stuff. Right? It's I coming mean, so. The FDA I says can't believe freaking chocolate's racist chocolate. nowadays. No, I'm teasing. Yeah, so the, <laughs> in the wrong, so na- wrong the neighborhood. Mask, but it's still, yeah, it's still it's chocolate. Still coming from, you know, it's still, in my mind, it's still chocolate. So, uh, but that's like a blank canvas. We have white chocolate. You can add all these mm-hmm. different things to it, right? And it's just the sky's the limit in, in terms of the different types of white chocolates that you can make. Uh, by the way, and, and parenthetically, getting maybe a little bit down the road of the chocolatier. Uh, with the same equipment that I can make chocolate with from mm-hmm. cocoa beans, I can also make nut butters and nut pastes and things oh, like that as inclusion. Right. So uh, you can think of Reese's cups, right? So I could make pistachio pistachio nut butters. butters. I like pistachio the, butter. There's a just came uh, from Greece, and that was one of the favorite thing I brought back. I'm like, ooh, this stuff's good. I'm gonna make it. Jandouille, <laughs> I guess you could call it's like a like almost you could think of Nutella type mm-hmm. of flavor, right? There's uh, so your, you the machinery, how big is the machinery? Well, the, the different sizes. Like, would it fit uh, on this table? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Even the, the biggest one that I have would fit on this table. All of right. course, if I really get rolling, then there's some that are would fit in this room. Okay, let's, you know. why don't we but save that the for the next time? Maybe they we can get same. it in here. I'd yeah. like to do a full demo, taste chocolate, see how it is. Maybe we'll get some blindfolds and bring people in here and see what they like and let them vote on it. Yeah. Do something interesting. Absolutely. That would be a blast. I'd love so to do Wayne came in here. He, he saves people from bleeding out with the tourniquet, right? It's Smart TQ, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's an incredible product in and of itself, and he makes chocolate. This is an interesting guy. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for coming on. Well, thank Good you. to have thank you here you. today. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'll come back anytime you like. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, Wayne, for coming on Presentation Hell today, and it's uh, a great day here in Tampa, Florida.